since I was in college, so around the age of 20, I had suffered from extreme headaches um, and I was treated for migraines for years, um, went back and forth to various neurologists to try to determine the cause of the headaches, had CAT scans, MRIs, and they could not find the problem. There was what I would call blind episodes throughout the day where I would be working at my desk and I would for a minute or actually more like 30 seconds my eyes would just kind of whiten where I would have to like blink my vision back into sight and they actually diagnosed me with, at that time with pseudotumor cerebri. Alison had the classic symptoms of increased intracranial pressure, also known as pseudotumor cerebri. She had depilidating headaches, she had a whooshing sound in her ears bilaterally, also known as passatile tinnitus, and more importantly, she had transient vision loss many times throughout the day. So one of the consequences of elevated intracranial pressure is swollen optic nerves, which is called papilledema. Papilledema can result in blurry vision, and it also can result in transient visual loss episodes, as were occurring in Allison's case. We don't always know what causes the elevated intracranial pressure, but we do know that we have to relieve it in a timely fashion so that we can spare any damage to the optic nerves and prevent any permanent vision loss. Sometimes medications can do the job and lower the pressure, but in some cases medications don't work well and patients have to seek out a surgical procedure to reliably and quickly lower the pressure. The classic uh, surgical procedure to treat patients with severe idiopathic intracranial hypertension is to undergo a, a procedure called shunt placement that aims at draining excess fluid from the brain and thus relieving pressure. Allison was scheduled to have this procedure and that's why she was transferred at Cornell. Over the last 10-15 years, we've discovered that certain patients with pseudotumor cerebri do have venous sinus stenosis and it's essentially a narrowing of the large veins of the brain. While inpatient at the Weill Cornell, Allison had a special type of MRI scan called MR venogram that did show that she has venous sinus stenosis. Dr. Dinkin and I are conducting an FDA approved trial to evaluate whether repairing that stenosis in the large veins of the brain can relieve the patient's symptoms. When the MRI scan showed that Allison did have this type of lesion, she was referred to us to be considered for the trial. All of my questions along with my husband um, was what if, you know, what if this happens or what if this doesn't go right and um, being patient number 10, I didn't feel as confident that they would have the answers. However, um, their explanations and um, and benefits that would that would happen after having this procedure and it was how it was less invasive and overall their their experience and the way that they sat and explained every single detail of the surgery really made me feel confident to have the procedure done. Placement of the shunt to relieve the patient's symptoms is typically very effective but it's an invasive procedure. The advantage of the venous stent procedure is that it's a minimal invasive treatment Everything is done through a small incision in the groin. The patients typically go home one or two days after the procedure with a small band-aid in the groin area. So this illustration here demonstrates what can happen to a patient who has narrowing of the veins that drain the head. Normally, spinal fluid drains from the brain into these large veins and flows out through the internal jugular vein in the neck. But as you can see here, we have two areas of narrowing of the veins where the red circles are. And so much like an accident will cause a backup of traffic behind it, this narrowing will cause slow flow through the veins behind it and therefore slow drainage of the spinal fluid into the veins. This will in turn result in increased intracranial pressure and all the symptoms uh, that result thereof. In this uh, clinical trial, what you do is essentially insert the stent which is a fine metallic mesh that you see here in magnification to alleviate the stenosis or relieve the stenosis in one of the two sides we don't have to treat both sides we need only one normal vein and this will allow the blood and CSF to drain their normal pathway from the head towards the chest and this will relieve the increased pressure in the head and alleviate the symptoms of pseudotumor cerebri so far, 80% of the patients enrolled in the trial have had either resolution or improvement of their headaches with placement of the venous stent, while 100% of the patients have had either improvement 
or resolution of their visual complaints. And then finally, 100% of the patients have had resolution of pulsatile tinnitus, which is the whooshing sound that some of these patients experience from the disease. What is especially gratifying about the venous stent procedure is that this offers a solution to many patients in whom the venous stenosis is actually the root of the problem. Therefore, by repairing the stenosis with the placement of the stent, we are actually treating the cause of the problem. So it's been about four months since I actually had the procedure done and I feel amazing. I actually am completely off of Pseudotumor, the Diamox medication. I'm just on an aspirin um, regimen that I have to take for a year. Um, but other than that, I'm on no medications. I don't have to take any type of medications. I was living on Advil, Tylenol, anything I can get my hands on, Excedrin, migraine, to try to treat my head pain. Um, I can't tell you the last time, other than the, the day I came out of surgery, that I've actually had this headache um, that I talk about all the time. And um, one of the other benefits is that noise that I had in my head that I didn't even know was a problem of this is completely gone.